All right, so podcasting and the technology that runs it has been around for about almost 15 to 20 years. Uh, we've been doing it here on our network for quite a while. And of course, today we're gonna actually dive into something that's happening in the podcast community. And that is an evolution into a thing called Podcasting 2.0. My name is Paul Barron, this is TechPath. Today's topic is going to go into deep talk about how podcasting or should podcasting evolve. And uh, there's only one person to actually talk about podcasting with, and that is the podfather himself, Mr. Adam Curry. Great to have you on the show, man. Hey, Paul, thank you very much. Good to see you. Fellow Austinite, always nice to hang out. <laughs> It is. Uh, Texas is great, a great place to hang, and I'm so glad when I found out you were in Texas, I went, whoa, wow, you, you're right down there oh, with I Rogan and the, this the whole that crew. That should be easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, easy. All right, so Adam, uh, obviously for, for some of our viewers and listeners, a lot, we have a lot of people that maybe do not necessarily follow the podcasting uh, lore, so to speak. You and, of course, Dave Weiner were really the creators of podcasting in general, Talk to me a little bit about kind of how that started first, can we, so we can kind of step set that up. Yeah, in uh, in 2000, which could really predates podcasting's traditional genesis of 2004. Right. Um, I was living in Amsterdam, and they had just rolled out cable modems, which was a big deal. Not because you had uh, fast internet, but because it was always on internet. You no longer had to dial up. I mean, this was quite the revolution. Not everyone remembers that, but this is uh, 21 years ago. We were like, whoa. And, you know, this is around the time when Napster was just getting started because people could actually keep their uh, their computers online and they could share files. And there, But there was no multimedia experience. I'd always dreamed of broadcasting on the Internet from the day I saw it pre-web. I was like, holy shit. I'm sorry. Holy crap. This, this is going to be something great. Um, uh, but there was no multimedia experience because of the lack of the bandwidth. So it was like this click. And you waited and you waited and you waited and you saw something spinning and then it would download. You had to click it and then it would open up in a player. And then it was just no experience. Um, and interestingly, there were a couple of streaming protocols like real audio and real video that they were trying at the time. Um, but I thought um, if you could, since your computer is always on, if you could have some widget in the background, you can tell I'm not, I'm not an engineer, um, that was just sitting there waiting and when it knew there was something you wanted, it downloaded it and then told you that there was something new, you would eliminate all of that wait time. So it was just a mind trick. It wasn't all that all that hard to come up with. Uh, but it took me a while. I flew to New York, actually, to, uh, um, to try and convince Dave Weiner to add this into RSS, which he had created. And RSS is a, is a beautifully decentralized uh, format, really. Um, right. So a single file can tell you, you know, how to fill up a web blog or uh, or how to uh, you know how to look at a at a podcast app and what information to put in there um, and actually went back and forth and he finally he finally got it after I you know convinced him by programming in his own tool there which he said look I'll put this stuff into RSS but you can never use my software again because that was really just atrocious what you did so uh, I went the extra mile we played with that for about three years and you know, we just moving stuff back and forth and he had a little tool so we could uh, essentially a proof of concept uh, until I saw the iPod. And when I saw the iPod, I went, oh, oh, no, this is not a jukebox. This is not a digital Walkman. That's a radio receiver. And it looked just like my old Sony AM transistor radio, that first white iPod, you know, really heavy, got hot because it had a hard drive in there. Um, and so I went about cobbling a script together that would look at an RSS feed, find a new, uh, um, a new file to download, a new MP3, would download it, then, which at the time was to your iTunes on your computer, would trigger an update to your iPod, and then you'd have that show on your, uh, on your mobile listening device. So the illusion of uh, click and wait, you know, the click and wait problem was gone, the illusion that something was new there for you and you could play it right away. And that sparked this this kind of inside me as well, like, oh man, I can broadcast every day. And it's like this new idea of listening by, by you know, on demand. Um, and it just kind of blew up from there. And I started doing a daily podcast called The Daily Source Code mm -hmm. and developers came around and they started developing apps. And then in 2000, we moved that quite successfully. And then in 2006, uh, Steve Jobs uh, asked if I had some time to come and talk with him to which I said, 
Let me check my calendar. And uh, <laughs> then uh, that was when he introduced the podcasting in iTunes. And from there, yeah. just psh, just took off. So essentially, you you got a chance to talk with Steve. He said, "Hey, let's let's put this into iTunes and start this whole thing." That was about the time when we started doing our first podcast. It was about two thousand six or seven. Makes and sense. And at the time, yeah. I, yeah, at the time, I mean, we had maybe uh, I don't know thirty listeners, <laughs> and and that we thought you know this is going to change the world. And and of course, it took forever, like most technology does. And then of course. Uh, pseudo 2018, 2019 podcasting blows up again. Um, but interesting, that's a decade later. When you saw the evolution of where podcasting has come from, uh, so, you know, if you look back before 2015, podcasting was still very, very um, unusual. It still wasn't a major media product. It wasn't something that people were looking at to advertise on. And there definitely wasn't as many podcasters. What do you feel like was the catalyst to, to basically lift podcasting as a medium to where it is today? Because in the last three years, it's absolutely exploded. Well, that's a good question. And, uh, and there is a history to it. Uh, while podcasting was ramping up and it was in the news, top of the tech news, one of uh, what we thought might be a competitor to the company I had at the time, Podshow, was this company called Odeo. And I, I was a little concerned. You know, sorry? Twitter. Yeah, well, exactly. I was yeah. a little concerned that, you know, who are these guys? What do they have? And I'd see, they never launched their platform, but I'd seen it and they had this one critical thing, which I liked, which was a big problem in podcasting, which interestingly has come around again today, is subscribe the right terminology for um, uh, subscribe, literally subscribing to a feed and getting these podcasts. And these audio guys had, had chosen follow, which I thought was really interesting. And they never launched. They pivoted. They became Twitter. The follow thing was there. It was, in essence, an RSS-based site when they started, which is probably why it failed, uh, the fail whale, as you recall. Then we got the YouTube acquisition. We had Facebook opening up to everybody. We had Instagram. We had all the, I mean, and then social media, the same time Google killed off Google Reader. So the idea of you owning your own feed, uh, except for a podcast feed, but a blog feed was gone because your timeline is now Twitter, it's Instagram, it's uh, it's Facebook. And then um, we had the streaming uh, television providers, Netflix, I would say was the biggest one. And that shepherded in a whole new age of uh, viewing habit and, and a different type of content where a movie is now sometimes a, a five a five hour movie broken up into five pieces and you stream it that way and you like it. And we were binging, we were binging our asses off. And um, so as podcasting continued to grow, and it was just a nice industry, um, it had its, its downside because it's by nature decentralized, no one owns it. So when Silicon Valley can't own something, they don't care about it. They really don't care. In fact, they try to steal it and try to capture it and try to make it their own. And podcasting was way too powerful at this point. There's no way you could, uh, although some are still trying, you couldn't really decouple that, that whole ecosystem. Uh, and it was the podcast serial that um, brought people back to an innate, and again, I love that it's the content that did this, back to an innate human need we have, which is some anticipation, the idea of the cliffhanger. So you couldn't binge serial. You could, if you mm -hmm. came in late, you could listen to episode one, two, three, but you know, you'd have to wait until next week for the next one. And because of the format of the true crime, people got insane. Like, oh, I, I can't wait to hear. I, and we hadn't heard this for a good 15 years. You know, we used to have right. Who Shot JR. We used to have these big cliffhangers. Just the idea that you'd wait until next week to see what happened on Hawaii Five O. you know, <laughs> whatever. Um, so it was this continuing thread, and that content drove it. And then and then people got real. I think the true crime category became super interesting. And once yep. that happened, um, you know, now... Just every and I, and the comedians, like we cannot discount the comedians. In fact, Joe Rogan is uh, probably one of the the biggest drivers of today's modern podcasting, um, and the people that he helped get on board. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so uh, so really, I mean, in, in essence, it was the Game of Thrones type model that really kind of amped it up. Do you feel like there was a media component that was missing? Obviously, advertising is really taking hard hits uh, on almost every aspect of the industry itself. But when you look at podcasting, it has kind of this natural 
approach to advertising where hosts a lot of times just lace it into the content. Sometimes you don't even know if you, it's not like Ben Shapiro where it's like, and just when, you know, where you jump into it, well, you can kind of hear. Ben Shapiro is yeah. talking to you like this and he'll be saying a couple things and all of a sudden, gold, boom. let me tell you about gold, everybody. <laughs> it's like, whoa, hold on a second, Ben, what did you just do? Yes, that's yeah, Ben Shapiro. Well, so when good. we first started, <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I raised a lot of money from venture capitalists in San Francisco, like Kleiner Perkins and Sequoia and Sherpalo and, we started Pod Show because I thought that we could right. make a network of programming um, that would change advertising based much more on this personal um, host red type uh, advertising. I found not only was that very difficult, but because of its very decentralized nature, write this one down, you cannot monetize the network. You can't monetize a network. You can't say you're all our shows and we're all going to make money together. It doesn't work. Um, people get upset. Uh, the, all the money goes to the top shows. And what I noticed very early on, podcasting is inherently not brand safe. And when you're not brand safe, you're not going to get any advertising. And brand safeness is, in fact, at the root of all cancel culture today. Uh, maybe not the intent behind cancel culture, but it is the mechanism by which people get canceled. And I'll take it one step further. Uh, advertising is literally censorship. Maybe not more than you not talking about a competing product, but right. it changes the game. And I've been in, I've been in, I have start help build a lot of the commercial internet, uh, and I know it's just it's just censorship. So you get that what you wind up getting is just like YouTube has become a lot of people being very careful using coded language to not say stuff they really want to say, and then people walk away from that. It sucks mm -hmm. and it's not interesting, which was part of what made podcasting so cool. Right. Well, okay. So, so monetizing the network. When you talk about that, because I, I followed you at, at Mevio and kind of what you guys were doing, because it was something that basically we built our network on was the concept. Mm -hmm. That, and mm -hmm. I would agree with you in the sense that you can't, because if you look at Maker Studios and all the different YouTube multi-channel networks that were out there that were trying to do this, it was yeah, it was very difficult. Because you're right, you had the the top stars, and then you had the rest. Um, do you think, though, if you go the route of companies that are owning all their own content, uh, producing all their own shows, harvest in, and essentially creating their own platform, much like a Rogan, if you look at Rogan, um, or if you look at others, I mean, not necessarily a Gimlet or a Wondery or someone like that, but someone that, you know, maybe kind of like us, where we have one or two front people that kind of go across a, a whole variety of content and monetize against that. What are your thoughts on that working versus kind of that uh, that unpaid approach to more audience or Patreon support? Okay, so um, I would call this kind of the the Twit model this week in tech, where you have yeah. uh, you know yeah. kind of one central place. Um, I think that works for, and you you do have a specialized type of content. Um, you come across in general as your operation is brand brand safe. Um, so I think that's a completely valid model, and I sure hope it's working. Um, what myself and my partner, John C. Dvorak, who I've been doing No Agenda with now in our 14th year, what we decided, and this, and this is important to the story of where we are today, um, yeah. we were just chatting, we were kind of, not. I, we've never really been friends, but we appreciate talking with each other and one-upping each other on, on stories, whatever. And we decided to do it as a podcast and we called it no agenda because we had no agenda and it was just two guys yapping and this now you know turned out turned into this big powerhouse of a show but we we definitely were not interested in advertising um and as we uh you know as we moved into episode three or four we said you know the stuff we're doing here it's actually a lot of work uh we're researching we're getting clips we're doing stuff uh, you know really that's a lot of news reading and consuming and spitting that back and we said, we're, you know, we're not going to do it for free. So um, what's the value you can provide? We're providing some value. You listen to this show for an hour. Uh, was it worth to you? And so a couple things happened here. One, we discovered very early on that if you ask people to send you money and don't give them an amount, you will be delightfully surprised. And if you frame it in that way, it's like you just you could have gone to a movie for an hour and a half you might have taken a date, had a drink, uh, that might have cost you 50 bucks. Was our hour and a half of podcast worth it to you? And uh, and you tell me. Um, 
And at this point, the, uh, the marketplace for creative product had been destroyed. As much as I love Steve Jobs for bringing Apple in, or bringing podcasting into iTunes, he destroyed, uh, created them a, 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 a true price discovery for creative work. When I see the Beatles, I want to hold your hand in the, in the iTunes music store for 99 cents. I will pay $99 every day of the week for that song. It's the best love song ever written, in my opinion. Uh, can't even do that. When I get an app, um, the most an app developer can pretty much ask for that is 99 cents, but really 99% are free because there's, there's just been this mindset of driving it down to 99 cents. So we've had no price discovery. And when you say, go ahead, what is it worth to you? A lot of people send me $5. And, and, and surprising amounts send uh, $50. And some sent $500. And lo and behold, there's a guy who sent $5,000. And we saw that. We went, okay, we're never limiting <laughs> what you can send us ever again. And we turned yeah. it into the value for value model. And in addition to that, we said, this show is not just you valuing us, sending us money. In fact, you're not even a listener anymore. You're a producer, and it's your job to produce this show. And we do it with time, talent, or treasure. So you can just you know, promote us. If you can do artwork with one of the few shows that has fresh album art every episode, um, you can help us do clips. Everybody has a, a field of expertise. Tell us. Don't go back later and say, you guys were wrong about that. I'm a, I know all about it. So you tell me up front so I can pass your knowledge along. And sure. um, so people feel good that they're providing value, whether it's monetary or not. Um, and then in crept one more thing, numerology. Turns out that mm. if you let people do whatever they want, they're going to send you coded numbers. They're going to send you three to send you $10.69. <laughs> and they're going to send you $80 and 08 cents. If you've ever done the calculator trick, Paul, you know what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. And, and so this feedback loop became a thing. Uh, and it became so wonderful. Two families have, have gone, uh, you know, we're now in our 14th year. We have you know, we've had kids in school. We're fine. We're not millionaires, but we, are, we really have done incredibly well. Uh, and I, this is I, the longest job I've ever had and the most fulfilling ever because it is truly valued. And I've had big TV shows, shows, big radio shows. This direct connection with the audience is just, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, so that's the model that we, that we uh, put in place. And it's good because it turns out you make more money than advertising and you have zero meetings. And that is what mm -hmm. John and I really found important. No meetings, no advertisers, no uh, redoing of host reads, none of that. We do the show and if you guys, like, we're like the butcher. If you don't buy our meat, we're going to go away. And we're sincere about that. I mean, it was a little easier 10 years ago to say we could be doing something else. But, you know, it is true. We could always be doing something else. So that's the genesis of where we are today. And we and, it, and there's a whole, by the way, we're never asked to come to a podcast conference to explain how we do it. Everyone's always running around after advertising. Yeah. And so, but there was, so now here we are today, um, and I'll just uh, take the liberty of probably what your next question would be, is now podcasting <laughs> 2.0, because something very interesting happened in relation to this genesis. The yeah. meeting with Steve Jobs, which is, I mean, an hour. I had an hour with him privately. It was one of the, you know, next to Quincy Jones, kind of my top meeting. And uh, not only did he ask me to bless podcasting in iTunes, because he had it ready to go. I mean, this was not, this was like a formality. Um but I also gave him the index. We had started building an index of podcasts. Uh, it was actually a distributed index. So, well, here, take this so you can get it going. It's kind of categorized and you can build it up. Um, and what I, by, what I did there, although it helped launch podcasting, and in hindsight, um, well, I mean, we're all older now. I didn't think it through. So uh, Apple pretty much has owned podcasting. And they've been great stewards of it. I have no problem. I mean, in fact, I'm very appreciative of what they've done. But you still have to go through their process to get listed. And then all of a sudden, there was uh, in the in the in the 2020 yes, 2020 cancel, maybe 2019, you know, cancel can and volley, um, right. a number of podcasts, uh, including a fellow Austinite Alex Jones, were uh, taken off of Apple. 
And this was significant because um, there are very few, or there were very few independent podcast apps. Uh, the ones that were out there did not have the resources to create the infrastructure necessary to run an index because you've got millions of feeds, you're indexing, it's a lot of work. So they uh, give their access to their index through an API to independent software developers who make these almost free apps. Um, and all of a sudden, uh, Alex Jones and a number of other podcasts were gone from their, um, uh, from their uh, podcast apps as well. Now, that's one part. The next part is Joe Rogan uh, left the, the public ecosystem, and he right. went uh, behind uh, the walled garden of Spotify. So now if you're an independent app developer who really makes an important part to the whole loop, I'm the transmitter with my feed, the app is the radio. And we, I'm ta we take radios for granted, but if it's only Apple, Spotify, and Google, well, that's not going to be good. Um, and if the independent uh, developers are, A, not able to um, uh, determine what they want in their database, but um, also uh, are not in the deal flow, they're not a part of advertising, they're not a, a part of the host reads, they don't get anything. They can throw mm -hmm. an ad maybe, so we were losing our... our our ability to um, have anybody build a radio that would work with this kind of stuff. At the same time, there's one or at least one company controlling the content. So uh, I decided we had to do two things. One, we had to preserve podcasting as a platform for free speech. Uh, that means that we have a, a, an index, podcastindex.org, which is completely independent. Um, it is uh, value for value based. And uh, we are we operate under Section 203, so nothing can be taken down. Of course, there are valid law enforcement, etc., which we have to adhere to. But that's not we have not encountered that. Um, so that's one. So if you're in the database, you're in the database. You're in the index, you're in, and you're good. We're distributing that, so anybody can have a copy of it. We'd like it to be functionally distributed uh, uh, and decentralized. Um, and this gave us the opportunity for mission number two. And this is we is uh, Dave Jones, who I've been working with him for 10 years on software projects and Eric Mackey, who uh, does our uh, keeps us legal. Um, uh, I knew that podcasting as an ecosystem would not survive unless we had a way to retool it so that it becomes a platform of value and that everybody can participate in that value flow. Right. Um, so that means the app developer, why couldn't the hosting companies participate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and at the same time, I was starting to learn about the Lightning Network, which is a layer two yeah. uh, on Bitcoin. And yeah, uh, a typical fashion for me, usually I'm 10 years early, but I think now that Bitcoin is 10 years old, I'm probably right on the money. Um, I saw the opportunity to implement um, a a version of value for value with micropayments, which is instead yeah. of pay to play, which is what most systems and most mindset is, we do play to pay. So you press that play button, it's streaming value to the podcaster, what you determine, what you think yeah. is valuable. Yeah. So we have price discovery here for the first time really in modern uh, creative works where there's not someone else determining how much your piece can be transferred for. Now, that's part of NFTs, I think, is a part of this, uh, you know, it was an uncorking of people wanting to value creative work. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that goes along, I think, with an NFT. But it was like, oh, uh, yeah, this is worth $660 million. Yeah. Why not? Just yeah. one, it may be. And that was never possible with digital media. Well, and, and you're right, because, I mean, things like Patreon, the first thing they do is they put a price tag on at different levels. So you're, you're right. There is no price discovery in there. And you and can I do, get deplatformed down the line from their, uh, exactly, from their payment Patreon. processor. This is this yeah. is the next problem that, that, that you know, I, I thought and I think that uh, our system will solve. Well, okay, so there's a lot to unpack here because when you look at it, <laughs> I have no elevator pitch, uh, man. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's very, that's uh, the, freedom is always complicated. You got you to work on it. <laughs> it's an evolving process. Um, all right, so so the evolution of it is to get to the point where essentially you're you're talking about a true decentralized network, which is essentially what Bitcoin is, the blockchain in general. Mm -hmm. Kind of why that technology is advancing so much with kind of that one percent of the technophiles in the industry that really watch this show are, are moving fast into Bitcoin and other kind of blockchain technologies. 
So what, what you're saying is that um, essentially advertising goes away, potentially, if this were to be adapted into other media companies. Because if you can imagine any media company that would just move to a blockchain type uh, model of how to distribute the content, you're no longer needing the likes of a Google, a Facebook, a Twitter even, so to speak, because much like your own podcast, you're using the value of the network itself to self-expand. With, with that kind of as a model, with Podcasting 2.0, how does the technology attach in to the blockchain and how does a Satoshi get passed over? Where, where is that technology starting to plug into the RSS, I guess? Okay. Um, so in order, uh, let me think of the best, because there's a couple things we can talk about. Um, so I do want to come back to the advertising because it's not mutually exclusive and there's reasons right. why I'm saying that. Um, so if you look at, first of all, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. So I, I, I think that Bitcoin has inherent properties that make it successful, um, yep. that make it truly immutable and no one's in charge of it. It's just this alien thing that's kind of running and everyone keeps the alien spinning. Uh, it's very different from um, uh, cryptocurrencies that still have some other entity that that has some control over it. So sure. a blockchain yep. is not the same Stable as Bitcoin. coins, et cetera. Now the yep. problem with uh, Bitcoin is the the transfer time. So you know, mm -hmm. in, and it's it's not very efficient with fees, et cetera, to send you know micro payments. So for a couple of years now, the Lightning Network is a layer two, um, and without going into too much detail. It, it's off-chain, so it's a it's a separate layer, a separate network, which is, interestingly, its topology is very similar to how uh, the internet was built with uh, routing and peerage, etc. Um, and because of its nature, you can do uh, uh, very small micropayments. Uh, the the unit is a satoshi. It's one hundred millionth of a bitcoin yeah. uh, by today's price, zero point zero zero six. Uh, dollars, so it's you know it's it's a six, uh, it's not even a half of a penny, and we can go down to milli satoshis, uh, and you can transfer those with an extremely uh, extremely low network fee because you're doing more routing and uh, transferring instead of processing and doing confirmations. So that's part one. Um, because you can do the micro transactions, it's perfectly suited uh, for you know, sending stuff per minute, which was kind of, I did a calculation. There's a, it's more now, but at the time, 100 million uh, people in the United States listen to podcasts. Their average is one hour a day. Um, so that's uh, six, uh, uh, 600 million hours, but you have 100 million people listening to one hour a day, seven. Um, although we have converted for our show, we think about 3% of the audience to actually uh, send money voluntarily, might mm -hmm. be 4%. Mm -hmm. We feel 1% is totally doable. That means there's a million people that are listening to podcasts, listen to an hour a day, and would be willing to uh, uh, to support that. And there's proof of the support with Patreon, and people you know, definitely want to support oh, yeah. uh, these systems. So that means if you value um, at your 99 cents Steve Jobs a number, or let's just say a dollar, one hour of a podcast has got to be worth a dollar to everybody. Well, now all of a sudden you got a million dollars a day of money spinning around the podcast ecosystem. Um, so we uh, looked for a, a way for podcastindex.org to play a role in this new marketplace, this new price uh, discovery mechanism. And we found that the way for us to do it as a traditional aggregator is to help people um, establish what we call a value block. So it's really, um, we've almost become, although we're, uh, we don't really manage anything, we're just an aggregator of the, of the information, we've become a modern ASCAP, BMI, Harry Fox agency, so that when a, uh, a podcast listener says, okay, I think this, uh, this podcast is worth uh, 10 cents a minute, and it goes, it starts sending that 10 cents towards that podcaster, the first thing the podcast app will do is say, okay, what's the payment information? Who gets part of the split? So we've made it so that if you have a host, you could take 40% for you, 40% for the host, 5% yeah. for your producer, and another 5% for your, uh, your, your parents who uh, lent you the money to get you, uh, to get you up and rolling. And that happens in real time so uh, four pennies goes to the podcaster, A, podcaster B, 
then we got a couple pennies going to the uh, to the engineer, the producer, and a couple to the investor. And that's down at the episode level, and that can be in perpetuity. And you actually, as a podcaster, will ultimately control this through your RSS feed. Uh, the reason why we've jumped in here is to help people manage that in the probably 24, 48 months that the hosting companies uh, will not have this implemented. Um, yeah. And so now uh, we just those, now we have four apps that are actively doing uh, this value for value transfer, um, and it's incredibly exciting to sit at your computer and watch every minute multiple payments come in. Now these are small; it's one satoshi, three satoshis. We uh, uh, one of the apps is Sphinx Chat. They invented the boost concept, so you mm -hmm. hit the boost button, which can be predetermined with an amount. Surprisingly, a lot of 33s and 69s and 8008s, and that then shoots one individual big payment at that moment. So now we get to something that makes podcasters really excited. For the first time, we no longer have download statistics. Well, let me see how many phones downloaded my MP3 file. This tells you nothing, which is part of the advertising problem because who's listening? We all know it. And when they listen, do they just skip through the ads? Come on, we're all doing this. We know it. We've heard that ad 10 times. We'll skip through it. So this is part of the reason why advertising will never work, because no one's willing to stand up and be the Nielsen of the business and say, yeah, we're full of crap and we'll lie and we'll say that these, these numbers are real and we'll stand for it. Because that's what TV ratings are also pretty crap. Mm -hmm. Now, because this, this is all on the blockchain, you can now see exactly when people were listening and not just when they were listening when they really I liked like something listen. with the boost button yep. right now you're cooking with gas now you got some statistics so for me personally i don't mind if you have ads i some i like ads because sometimes i want to hear about a product that i may not get an ad for someone else smart enough to know if i'm interested in this ad but when i fast forward i don't feel bad about it because i know mm -hmm. that i'm going to be now i'm a high value guy i put 100 uh, sats per minute so that's uh, uh, per uh, yeah per hour. That's six. That's three dollars an hour, and I'll probably boost another two if I like something I hear. Now, you put all this together, and you get something really phenomenal. There's already people who are using it, saying I'm making more than I did in ads from day one almost. Um, so it's small. So for someone, but it's, yeah, yeah, for someone to get involved in it. So you said you had three different. Uh, Applications that are, are running with the 2.0 version now. What, yeah, which, well, which well, podcast apps? Well, um, yeah. So, so podcasting 2.0 interestingly grew into something much more. Um, now we have a whole bunch of extra features which these apps are implementing, which is chapters, chapter images, transcripts. Um, we have soundbite tags. We have location. We have see. I mean, we've really upgraded podcasting. This is just one small piece of it. Sphinx mm -hmm. chat. <clears throat> Sphinx dot chat. Um, they, they were our early, early integrator. Uh, they've been up and running for a while. They're not a traditional podcast app. They're more like a super chat app, like a WeChat. Right. So you're right. in there, you can chat, you can transfer money, Satoshis with each other, and you can participate in podcasts. And, and it's kind of cool to chat at the same time. The Breeze app, <coughs> excuse me, B-R-E-E-Z, Israeli company. Uh, they came out with the newest version of their their Bitcoin wallet and has a podcast player in it and it is phenomenal. Um, mm -hmm. So they, and they're a new entrant and they they've been going for about a week now. Uh, PodStation is a is a, an extension for a Chrome browser and just today PodFriend PodFriend.com launched. They're a web app and they can do this. So it's a web mm -hmm. app and uh, Android and I think iOS is uh, on test flight. Um, so this is rolling out very quick. My hope was when we did this. We, on one hand, would see um, uh, traditional crypto wallet uh, developers add podcasting into their wallets. And then on the other side, we have podcast developers. And at podcastindex.org, we have, um, we must have 50 developers, of which 20 right. are doing just apps alone with all kinds of different experiences. Um, we wanted them to strap on this capability. And so, and today is actually the first day that that's really started to happen as uh, hopefully any app you use, we set it up this way. If you're using Overcast, I know Marco has said he's looking into this, um, it may just pop up one day as, oh, now you can stream value payments. And and again, it's 
that I think it's critical that this is value for value. It's not a paywall. You're not locked out from hearing the content. You can set it at zero if you want to. But as it turns out, if you remove all the middlemen and you let the consumer of the creative work determine the value, which is, I think, the definition of value can only be determined by the person holding the value, um, then you'll see that we have a very vibrant system and a lot of, uh, I think, a lot of shows that will be uh, supported quite well in uh, probably the same manner they were with Patreon without the downside of being uh, deplatformed from an index or being deplatformed financially and being locked into their pricing schedule, quite honestly. Yeah. Um, you know, that's that's sure. really the big downside is you can't yeah. value it and you can't price it effectively. There's no market mechanism until now. Yeah. All right. So I was looking at your index, uh, two million one hundred and five thousand podcasts in the index. Yeah. Uh, this is what surprised me in the uh, that published in the last uh, three days. This was, of course, a screenshot from just a few days ago. Eighty eight thousand. 10 days, 201,000, 30 days, 305,000. And at 60 days out, you're at 374,000, which tells me that we have a shitload of podcasts here that aren't really podcasts. They started yeah. something, it, it, it died. Okay, so. Exactly. All right, exactly. so, so, so that use of minutes, okay, because that does scare you when you look at 2 million podcasts, you think, well, it's how It's a little more there... interesting when you break it down, right? Yeah, it, well, yeah, you're talking about 88,000 podcasts here that really yeah. matter globally that are publishing frequently enough to really make a difference. Here's the thing. Okay, so if you're going with podcast as the potential vehicle here, could this work with other forms of media such as music? You know, why can't- I'm glad you asked that. Okay, all right, well, let's go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> yes, well, so back to the back to the, the, value, the value block, as we call it, the splits. This yeah. is um, royalties for the digital era without the nasty organization yep. in the middle. So I'll yep. give, and I come from the music business as well. So how it works, um, you know, you uh, someone plays a song, buys a song. What you know, it's, there's a whole bunch of rights, performing rights, sync rights. There's this music uh, uh, licensing and copyright law, very complicated. But in its essence, yep. um, these organizations like ASCAP, BMI, uh, they they go out and they collect the money. So they go to bars and television stations or radio stations, give us the money because you played it, whatever, they bring it in. And then 48 months later, out drops a penny to you. Most of it goes to the wrong person. You have to sue every organization. It's, and there's money is sticking everywhere. And, and, and then you know to add insult to injury, now the very companies who were supposed to be protecting the artists are deeply in bed with the labels and with this, with I'll just say Spotify, just Spotify yeah. number one, but Amazon, yeah. Apple, everybody, and now we've brought it down to pennies on the billions. So it's insulting, mm -hmm. and um, and it, it it needs to be changed. So now when you when you listen to a song in our same system, it just needs a different interface. Yeah. You can do yeah. the same system uh, or movie, but let's just say song. The minute someone listens, they can say, okay, so for me, my example of I want to hold your hand. So I want to pay $100 for this thing. Uh, and I want to make sure, and I can pay for it up front or as I'm, you know, bail out after a minute, doesn't matter. And I want to make sure that um, uh, a, uh, a fifth goes to each of the Beatles or their estates. And, uh, uh, and, and I, want to, I want a piece to go to Sir George Martin. Let's just put it that way. But maybe I want to break it down. I want to... Uh, one point to go to the bass player, one point to go to the percussionist, five points to the songwriter. This now occurs from the moment someone plays it, it gets split into all those destinations, complete accounting, complete transparency, no one in the middle to take your money and the people who facilitate it. So um, the app, the, in, in podcasting this case, would like 1%. It's all voluntary, but we'll say, hey, we'd like a percent. The index would mm. like a percent, 1% for facilitating it. Um, but we have now on my podcast, um, we have uh, one producer, uh, Dreb Scott, he does the chapters. And it's a lot of work. You got to listen to the show. I give him 5%. So now whenever I release a show, he is seeing Satoshi's value come into his wallet based upon the work that he did. And, and it's, it's a derivative of the whole thing, but it's fair and it makes sense. And he said, this is, like, this is so motivating. I, it, it's less than a dollar. But it's so yeah. motivating because I can see that people are enjoying something and they're telling me that at the same moment. 
And, and my belief is obviously over time that, as you say, you know, there's pretty much 80,000 podcasts. I'll, I'll chop that in half to 40, uh, taking away rebroadcasts and, and, um, and, and properties that would, it's not even appropriate to do this. And now you're talking some real interesting uh, distribution here. If we can get the audience comfortable with it. And, and so the, what I liked about Podfriend today is now just if you're playing a regular podcast, all of a sudden it pops up. It says, oh, you can boost this or you can set a, a number of um, a payment per minute. It just, it just got added. Uh, yeah. So it's really, you know, that's the kind of stuff that you want to see. And, and, and the onboarding becomes um, much more seamless than, uh, than you might think it would be the minute you put Bitcoin or crypto in front of something. Yeah. Okay. So Adam, okay. There's a couple of areas. One is um, maybe you should not be taking any small uh, flight plans anytime soon. Because <laughs> what yeah. you, Stay out of what hot you're... tubs, uh, no general aviation. Yeah. Yes. Now um, these are very, these are very, thank you. This is why I call myself the crackpot <laughs> on uh, our podcast. I'm crazy. No need to kill me people. You know, no need. I'm good. I'm just nuts. The, Thank you. Okay, so this this essentially uh, replaces the very business model of Spotify. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just about any distribution of content out there, if if something like this were to actually move forward, and with the speed in which crypto and the blockchain is moving, the likelihood of and I've I've had I study what Raul. I don't know if you've ever looked at or listened to Raul Paul over at Real Vision. Of course. He's really, Are you kidding me? <laughs> so, Ron Paul, so, 2008, the, uh, the audit the Fed, please. No, Raul, Raul Paul. Oh, Raul Paul. Raul. Oh, Raul Paul. At, yeah, at Real sure, Vision. definitely. Yeah, so he he's going down this direction of that the digital e-commerce is, we are at the precipice right mm -hmm. now. Bitcoin is simply the, the, the predicator of what's going to happen in that we eventually are going to see a complete transaction within the, the virtual space. It's happening in gaming. Uh, we're already seeing it moving. Gaming is probably leading the way in terms of where transactions uh, yeah. could occur. Definitely. Uh, so with that being the case, especially as artists, I'm surprised that uh, maybe a few artists have not jumped in into this, especially someone maybe even like a Joe Rogan, which, uh, I mean, here he's stuck over at, I feel like he's stuck over at, at Spotify having to you know perform for the man over there. I don't know if that's the case. But I know one thing, I rarely listen to Joe Rogan anymore, and I used to be a huge watcher and listener on YouTube. Now that his content is now coming out in clips and you know it's after the math or aftermath, it doesn't feel the same. Why wouldn't a, a Rogan jump right to a platform like this versus going with a Spotify? Um, okay, so let me approach it from a little different angle and tell you what keeps me so motivated that may help answer these questions. Okay. Um, so I'm, what turns out, the people who built Bitcoin and who have built the Lightning Network uh, are millennials, and they're a little bit older millennials. So most of them in the you know born around ninety two range, uh, so they're you know around twenty nine thirty years old. And um, let me and I have one myself. My daughter is thirty, so I, I understand uh, a little bit where they're coming from. But for sure, millennials has been kind of a like <laughs> millennials, like you know us Gen Xers, and I'm I'm. A Gen Xer with boomer tendencies being from 64, uh, you know, we're easy to dismiss them. But um, uh, they are, they will, of course, be the, the true uh, war heroes in this fourth turning we're in. And uh, what has happened to them is they were born in 92, around that age. Um, they were born during the, uh, the, the, the first Gulf War. Um, so there was all, it was messy. Uh, then we had 9-11. Uh, uh, then we invaded the wrong country, and uh, you know, which is confusing uh, to a lot of people, especially yep. young people. Um, and then we had the 2008 meltdown, and uh, they've all come. Uh, those who went to college uh, have come out. They have $100,000 in debt. They have a 15 an hour dollar the dollar an hour job, and they're sick of it. And they're sick of the people who screwed it up. They're really sick and tired of it, and they're checking out. They're not interested in mainstream media. Uh, uh, or M5M, as I call it, uh, they don't care about uh, the, the typical news. They and and they're smart. And a lot of them have figured out. Oh, wait a minute! I have absolutely no chance of winding up with a house and a dog and and a family if I continue to follow the system. My money devalues by ten percent a year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, oh, thanks for the stimmy check. So 
this is where GameStop comes from. Yeah. GameStop is not what the media tells us it is. GameStop is a very understandable, very beautiful reaction of, uh, of people saying, you know what, I'm sick of this crap. And in case people haven't noticed, it ain't over. The mm -hmm. GameStop is not over. There's still a huge systemic issue inside Wall Street. If you go look at the DTCC and how uh, trades are settled and how there's so much phantom stock running around, and that's what they're caught in. And so GameStop is a version of, you know what, screw you guys. We're, we're not going to be a part of that. The, the, the more positive uh, energetic love part, which I like, is Bitcoin, because you can take it in the philosophy of Bitcoin. When no one controls the money, there's much less reason for war. Um, no one can confiscate your money. Uh, it, it, you know, to the ultimate security is you have your seed phrase in your head. No one can take that from you, uh, at least not yet. Elon Musk may yeah. want some yeah. point with his neural link. But so, so it represents freedom. It represents harmony. It represents love. And if you look at the diversity, although I would say I'd love to see more women in the trenches, a lot of them are more at the top of organizations. And maybe that's a natural order of things. I don't know. Maybe Cleopatra it was right. You know, we all should be serving the queen. But it's incredibly diverse. It's global. And everybody works together to make it work. It is reminiscent of the early internet, when we were building routing and peering and uh, and border gateway protocol, it is right. reminiscent of the first round of podcasting. It, it is it is a deja vu almost for me. But so for me, what keeps me motivated is I want them to. These are the Zoomers now who will who will benefit from this. So I want the millennials to succeed. I want them all to be fabulously secure. The days of uh, I've got Bitcoin and here's my Lambo, they're over. That, that was, you know, that's the, the short-sighted uh, uh, group that, that have kind of been, you know, they've now been past the, the roadside. And what we see now is Bitcoin is a big black hole that is starting to suck everything into it, including the establishment. So right. that is the ultimate victory for the millennials. And along with that, I think we bring the first use case for Bitcoin, whereas we've had all this, okay, you can store your money in it and, and your money... Yeah, Bitcoin. The the slogan is "Money printer go burr, Bitcoin go up," which is pretty much a logical uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, f uh, calculation, and we're seeing it again with the with the stimulus yeah. uh, proposal. Um, now it's okay. I can actually share some of this uh, with things that I value to people that I value, and it's not a corporate controlled system, a global banking cartel that sits in the middle. People who get a piece of these payments that I am happy to give are, are keeping the system running. What that brings you is usually one or two more steps to get it working. Um, yeah. So when people say, gee, PayPal is so much easier. Well, sure. Have you ever been blocked by, pay by PayPal? Has your money ever been frozen by PayPal? It's scary when it happens. Um, now yeah. this, so freedom, as I said earlier, um, it takes a bit. You know, so I think we've made, brought it down to the level where it's relatively easy uh, to get on board. You can now even get the Strike Wallet app, which you connect literally like Venmo to your bank account or your debit card, and you can you can fill up your your podcast wallet uh, to your heart's content and uh, and go and stream away. Um, so it's. Um, uh, yeah, I think by the time they figured out that they need to come for me in the hot tub or the or the or the small aircraft, it may be too late. Maybe because too I late. think it's I think it's sucking people in. It really is. It's beautiful to see like this. Everyone, you know, and it's yeah. laughable when you see these hedge funds or you know Michael Saylor, Paul Saylor, whatever his name, Michael Saylor, Michael Saylor. <laughs> borrow a billion dollars at you know zero percent and then put it in Bitcoin. It's hilarious. Do they not see what's going on? This <laughs> the whole system is going to suck into this hole eventually. So do you it's, think it's a beautiful that, thing that to it, be part of? It is. Do you think though that with Bitcoin scenario, we'll just use Bitcoin because obviously it's the you know it's the big boy in the room in, in terms of blockchain. Can the governments? actually come in and start to implement restrictions and or regulation that potentially could kind of offset this? Or do you feel like it's just so big now, it's kind of snuck up on everybody. I think even global, you know, global uh, lawmakers probably just weren't ready for where it has come from. Do you feel like it's safe or do you feel like it's going to be one of those things? Obviously, you've bet podcasting 2.0 on it. So mm -hmm. what are your thoughts? Well, 
let's take a look at the at a real world scenario. Let's look at Nigeria. Nigeria uh, is uh, you know hyperinflation. Uh, they've got all kinds. They've always had issues with their with their money. Um, yeah. There's a lot of restrictions, and you really can't send money out of Nigeria to any of any of the neighboring countries to do any kind of cross border trade. It's tightly controlled, um, and so the Nigerians who there's a reason why they trick so many people with their Nigerian princess scam is because they're smart and they do the yeah. work and they figure it out and they figured out how to trick your brain and they they did well at it. Um, so um, uh, they so in Nigeria, uh, in 2019, two billion dollars in remittances came into Nigeria because Nigeria the true um, the true wealth is the people who go out into the world. Uh, they go to other countries, they become successful. They can't do in their own country and they send money back. That's your mm -hmm. remittances. So $2 billion of the Nigerian economy is coming in from Nigerians who have exported themselves to help their families. Uh, in 2020, that was from 2 billion went down to 50 million. Uh-oh, what happened? Because it was coming in in Bitcoin. They cannot stop it because it's like email. It's like yeah. email. It's like, if can you stop email? Uh, you can do a lot, but can you really stop it? No, you can't. So that's, it's, it's immutable that way. Now the transfer from uh, Bitcoin or any uh, cryptocurrency, which in the United States is now deemed as property, so you have capital gains tax or loss, um, that can be highly regulated and thwarted sure. and they can do all kinds of stuff. Sure. Um, but I can still go to any coffee shop anywhere in the mm -hmm. world and I can find someone I'll say, listen, give me a hundred bucks and I'll give you my Bitcoin right here. Or uh, I got a hundred bucks. Uh, you want to send me some Bitcoin? I'll hand it, I'll hand it right over. And this is what, this is how Nigeria operates. Yeah. So you no, the answer is you cannot. Um, now, is there a lot of, are there a lot of people out there with an agenda who want to make it sound scary and will... Uh, advise you not to and oh please wait for the u.s digital dollar because that'll be the yeah. one you want <laughs> um you know when they really control your money when they can absolutely do anything including devalue it right before your very eyes um so yeah. uh it, so the answer is no uh they can't the governments can't stop it uh will look i've been a pirate all my life i was doing pirate radio uh when the pirate ships were still in the north sea uh, we had Radio Caroline, Mi Amigo, uh, Veronica. Uh, I was a land pirate in Amsterdam. Um, it's, you know, did, did I get into trouble? Sure, we got all kinds of stuff. But you know what? Um, eventually, uh, it turned into podcasting. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so it's, just, it's just the mechanisms and, uh, and the protocols that you use. And now for the first time um, with Bitcoin, we have something that b truly belongs to the people and no one can, no one can mess with it. Interesting. We just had Michael Saylor on on the show talking about this, and he's definitely in that camp of you know it's pretty much untouchable. This is just where it's going to go. It's just it's just a matter of time before the transition of both wealth and uh, the digital connection of how we move currency around, or not even currency, just value, moving value, moving value around. Because uh, value, value is it, yeah, yeah. Well, it's um, and well, here's the thing that that is disturbing to me. Now, we just had a snowmageddon here in uh, Texas. You probably followed that, mm -hmm. where yeah. first we had no power, then we, you know, so we were freezing, then our pipes broke, and we were drowning, and um, and it was very interesting. Now, my, my wife grew up in Indiana and Chicago. Um, I've been in, lived in New Jersey, New York, in Europe, so I, I know a little bit what to do in, in these situations. Not having power was interesting for, I think we were out for 50 hours or so, and we were one of the lucky ones. Um, so my neighbors, both incredibly smart people, were out there shoveling snow with garden shovels because who has a snow shovel in Texas? And um, and we're talking, and so the power's out, and you know we're we're charging our devices in our cars, and you know s staying warm there. And everybody has gas though, and it was very surprising when both of my neighbors and other people I respect who are very smart would say, "Man." You know, it would be so much easier if I could just light the stove, but you know, without the clickety, clickety, clickety thing, I, I can't get it to light. <laughs> and I say, oh, um, that, <laughs> the look on their faces when I say, you know, you can light that with a match, right? And they go, oh my God. Yeah, but this course. is what technology has done to us. 
we have uh. become so abstracted from, you know, most young people, Zoomer age, to them, the internet is the platforms. It's uh, Facebook, uh, Google, Twitter, uh, YouTube, uh, Instagram. They have, you know, they open up a browser. Oh, that's my Google. No, that's a web browser. That's your gateway to freedom. But okay, you want to call that your Google or your, oh, I have privacy. I have DuckDuckGo. Okay, fine, whatever, fine. Um, <laughs> completely unaware of what you can do with this network. We, for 14 years, we've been doing a show outside of any big platform. We are, are, <coughs> our hosting and bandwidth, which of course one of our producers has been managing for a decade, is $500 a month, even though we have 1.4 million listeners, more or less. So, you know, so that's a lot of data being transferred. Um, we, you know, there's all kinds of uh, smart ways to do it, but, but more importantly, we're lacking an education in our young people today. Instead of saying, oh, we've all got to learn to go, girls, learn to code. No, why don't you as parents take some responsibility, get, get that old laptop from the closet, throw it in front of your kid with a Linux uh, distro and say, install that. And then I want you to set it up. And then I want you to set up your email. And then, you know what, why don't you set up a web server? Just do that. Yeah. And yeah. that that kind of education, so you just understand the fundamental basics of the network is as important, if not more important, than understanding the fundamentals of traffic and driving and machine performance when you get your license to drive. These are important yeah. things you need to understand what you can do because the back roads can really get you to somewhere to freedom much faster, but you have to be careful. So we need education in this area instead of just, here's your app and good God, people, stop with the, with the iPads and the phones and your toddlers in, their, in, the, uh, in, the, in the baby carriages. You have to stop this, no more in the stroller. You are ruining your children. You have no yeah. idea how destructive that is. Well, and, and okay, so I wanna jump back. Lots of, lots of variation there. I wanna jump back to advertising because you, you were gonna, gonna kinda go in that direction. Because that's kind of the question I have in 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 lieu of with the shift over to RS or excuse me podcasting 2.0, um, the ability to insert advertisers or or get maybe the advertising community because at some point the value might come from an advertiser that just says hey listen we don't want to go through an agency we want to go direct to you, uh, and we want to be able to contribute what we think is valuable for that you know opportunity. Do you ever see anything like that implementing into the system? Of course. Although, other I mean, than just, just the listener. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. The beauty of this is, again, it's all open. So the, our, this entire system can be used in any, any way. There's no, there's no uh, religion to it uh, other than just yeah. the formats and the protocols. I see a, a very easy world. So I listen to a number of podcasts and um, some of their sponsors. I've heard it. I don't need to hear that anymore. But some, you know, that's like, oh, that's an interesting service. And I will probably only hear about that, that product on that particular podcast. And I will listen to it. Uh, with the model and the reporting and all being open, transparent and available on the blockchain, this is the moment where even if someone is sending one Satoshi, even the host could say, well, you know, you listen to the ad and you're not fast forwarding through it. Um, I'll actually get uh, a, a 10 times payout from the advertiser based upon what you sent me. So if you really, mm, so it's like okay. uh, like NPR would say, we've got a matching donation. I mean, I can come up with a million of these ideas. Yeah. One, and the, yeah. again, we now have the listening statistics. It's never been available. It's all horseshit. If they say, I know how many people are listening. No, you don't. You know how many people downloaded your file. You don't know anything about that. It's yes, there, you know, because of the way it's transferred, there are, there are enough metrics out there to get an estimation but it still doesn't really show that someone listened and cared about it. If they're sending right. even one sat a minute, they care about what they're doing or, they, you know, or, or they're on autopilot and the plane's gonna crash. I mean, then they just yeah. don't know what they're doing. So that as a, as a statistic is incredibly valuable. And again, to me, if I, you know, so now I listen to a Tales from the Crypt, which is a Bitcoin podcast, Marty Bent, kind of famous guy, and he has six minutes of ads in the beginning. And I'll fast forward through it while I'm at a at 100 sat a minute uh, value pay, uh, value payment. And I'll stop if I listen to something, but I don't feel bad about it because I know that I'm going right. to listen for another hour and a half and he's going to get all the money he needs from me, more than he got from me from listening to an ad. Where do you think and what do you think is going to be the formats that will really prevail 
you know, because like in TV, it was the, you know, it was the half hour, one hour show. In streaming, it's the, you know, it's the movie or the short film. There seems to be a format developing in almost any media. Where do you think podcasting 2.0 will develop in terms of format? We're going to find out because we've, we've changed a couple of fundamental things. Um, no longer do you have to wait three days to get your podcast listed through the Apple process. No longer do you already have to feel like you are begging uh, for approval from somebody to get this done. Uh, I believe uh, one of the best, for in a format that I'm very excited about uh, would be a professor who can decide that he's going to put all of his lectures onto a podcast and he's going to do it uh, right after his three o'clock class. He's going to set it up and it's going to be ready and available for his four o'clock class. Good to go. Um, you know, forget what, you know, and with, with, uh, it's almost like a slideshow now with podcasting 2.0 features like uh, chapters, chapter images, et cetera, it become, becomes very instructional. Uh, I want to see that. I want to see, um, I want to see people who have the opportunity to do it the minute they're inspired uh, and have an idea. I think that we're losing 90% of all the, the cool formats and ideas and concepts because of the constraints that it takes just to get on it. Uh, a part of that is video. Uh, the podcasting yeah. ecosystem completely works with video. Most of the players right. work with video. MRSS. We have a different problem. Yep. It, well, the, the, the different, the problem is um, the cost so the hosting company, which that is not really decentralized very well, and that is also mm -hmm. on our roadmap. Um, hosting companies have a very tough calculation to make. Um, they need to be able to create the interface that is the, the front end to your RSS feed, so that tool, that is, a, a lot of it is statistics. Oh, we have the best stats come over here, which we've just blown out of the water because listen statistics, always more interesting than download statistics, for sure. Um, and if they, they need 80%, 90% of their shows need to be just shows that are doing okay, so you can charge people 20 bucks a month. Then you get your 5 or 10%, which are big, successful shows. They lose money on that. They lose it on the, uh, on the, the bandwidth. The store, so, they so the hosting companies, instead of explaining to you that it's too expensive to be running video for everybody over their existing infrastructure, they price it on storage. You can't have more than a gigabyte of data. Well, that's not going to be enough for a bunch of shows. Um, so the answer to that is IPFS, uh, the Interplanetary File System, um, which distributes this. And here it comes because now we have we have little micro payments flowing, right? So flowing to the app developer, flowing to people who are helping produce the podcast. Now we can have it where anyone can contribute and participate in podcasting by making their server available as part, it's a peer to peer as part of yeah. the IPFS network. And each time someone accesses the file or a piece of that file from your server, ding, you get a payment. Yeah. So now That's we true. can shift that $20 <laughs> from the hosting companies, probably give most of it right back to them, but on an yeah. equitable basis and they can uh, offset the load, they could work together. Hello, uh, they could work together and they could share that load because you still need servers, but when it's IPFS, you, know, you could have a server on the moon, on Mars, it's going to work everywhere. And then with this, with um, it's called LSATs, but there's many ways to do it with just an API token. You literally, at the moment you access, there's a small payment. It can be one Satoshi, it can be 10, it can also be per right. minute based. Now we're doing something cool. And, and again, um, only a small percentage is going to do this, um, certainly in these early days, because it yeah. is an extra step for everything. It's one extra step, and most people aren't willing to take that. Like, yeah, uh, sure. on, the, uh, on, the, on the creation side, people yeah. on, the, on the receiving side will, of course, gladly help out, do whatever. They figured out Patreon. We used to tell them to copy the RSS link. You know, come on. I'm sure they can figure out how to do this. Yeah, for sure. All right, so to, okay, so I, I see that going. You're you're saying though that potentially video, because that, that's the big issue right now. If you're trying to host a sure. video podcast, we kind of made that uh, determination a few years back when the cost to serve a video podcast up to iTunes was actually very expensive. Um, yeah. If you have any kind of downloads at all, um, and especially you know you're getting just that, you're getting downloads. Who knows if you're getting the watch through? 
versus like a YouTube where you are getting true, free. you know, watch free through bandwidth. rate. It's a free yeah. bandwidth. Uh, you're getting watch through rates. Of course, they're stacking ads in on top of this show, right? And here. they lose money. Yeah. They lose money on YouTube. Of course they do, but they don't care. How how is okay this is a whole nother conversation on just monetary theory of where this could go but all right so let's go back to the my questions here on podcasting um terrestrial radio been dying a dying breed for quite some time do you feel like podcasting 2.0 could be the nail in the coffin for terrestrial radio or do you think it's always going to just be here um well i mean we saw horse and buggies in uh, in central park you know, it, yeah. it never okay. goes away. Um, that's a relic now, of course. Um, transitions like this. this. Yes, radio Radio is now so bad, they, they cannot afford local programming yeah. even. And this was a great lesson for me. So I, I, I don't like saying anything's dead in an animate, you know, an industry isn't just dead. But, um, you know, so we had this uh, snowmageddon. And first of all, I'm a ham radio operator. There was my first disappointment. Where are all the ham radio operators who are going to save the world? I mean, I got my rig up. All right, everybody, what are we doing? We're coordinating. And all I got was, oh, my check. I'm like, okay, so that's not what I thought it would be in an emergency. I turned on uh, KX, um, KUT. I turned on uh, the NPR station. This is Terry Gross. Good morning. Fresh air. And I'm like, holy crap, we're in the middle of a crisis. I had to go to Todd and Dodd in the morning on, uh, on KBLJ who are just kind of like morning talk show guys, you know, they, they, they'll, they'll touch in the morning talk show. Guys. They were the best. They had listeners calling in like, here's yeah. what I'm seeing. Um, now the nature of podcasting doesn't allow for that, but that showed me, uh, you know, and KBLJ is a, a you know, legendary station in, uh, in Texas. Um, and it's, it's just on the air. I mean, the people working there are making $25,000 a year. I mean, there's no money in it whatsoever. So boy, do we need, do we still need local radio? Yeah, I feel so. Could it be delivered by any number of mechanisms? Yeah. So it's more yeah. the format of local radio, community-based radio, which is important. And I hope we don't lose or that it morphs into something um, because that's important. You need your hometown sure. uh, outlet. And where I think, to answer your question, uh, that's something that people will probably be readily willing and able to support with value for value payments to keep that right. going. Uh, and well, I mean, we don't have to do the, the week long uh, drive of, you know, you'll get a tote bag if you send us $5. No, <laughs> just do it while you're enjoying the show. That's uh, that, that yeah, is my sure. vision. That's my dream. Which could definitely happen, I think. Okay, so what are your last question here is your uh, thoughts please on... Please ask me more. Don't stop with one. <laughs> Come on, Paul. Uh, I could ask you a million. <laughs> but, I'm sure you uh, could. Well, when we go into a Westwood, someone like a Westwood One, who's kind of trying to create that collection of, of podcasts to create somewhat mm -hmm. of like a podcast radio station... Is that a potential that could spin out? Is there any commercial gain for companies that could be going in that direction to help maybe these emerging podcasts who can't sustain on a 2.0 platform themselves, mm -hmm. but yet they're still great content, great artists, whatever it might be. It's kind of like the, um, you know, the emerging artist in music. You know, there, there has to be a path for those to eventually become powerhouses. Do you feel like a Westwood One or companies like those could become, you know, the new... I mean, it's kind of like a Mevio, almost in a way, uh, in a 2.0 world, where you are getting, you know, other uh, potential artists moving into the podcast world. Otherwise, you're gonna. It feels like the cream might rise to the top, and there may be no room for, you know, guys like me. You know. <laughs> well, so, so I, I have to reject a couple premises there. Uh, okay. One is that if someone has outstanding content then there yeah. will be someone to pay for it. You can't tell yeah, me sure. that, that there's no way for us to make money even though we're great. And you know what? A lot of podcasts suck. So we okay. just have to admit That's it. That's true. Yeah. And so they move on. Now, I, I uh, believe, and I have enough examples, that you can take a podcast from zero in asking your audience to support you. And I think the proof is there in Patreon. Yeah. These are not yeah. huge podcasts. There's people making 10 bucks a month in Patreon. So the proof is there. It can be done, and and I you know I don't know if something's good or not. Uh, you can say yeah. this band is great, and I'll be like, whatever. So I'm not going to support them. You will. Um, and so 
by rejecting those two premises, it kind of uh, removes the whole idea of the necessity for a network. That's what I figured out. If you do the network to have the small person uh, also be able to survive and get a piece of it, it just doesn't work. It's, it's this, yeah. I mean, I've tried it. I've seen it. I've seen it been tried. Um, I see the destruction that is created in great properties uh, at some right, podcast right. networks. You know, now they have, because, you know, you get to the point where not everyone's equal in the deal flow. And then you have to have a union mm -hmm. because people who produce it or feel they're getting screwed. Dude, we produce our own stuff. You know, do we have yeah. a couple people to help? Yeah, but, you know, we don't have a huge staff. And, and, the, and the audience is a part of the building process. It is your yeah. community. It's your tribe. If they support you, you grow. If they don't support you, you're not, then you either need to change and make better content or get better audience. But you don't yeah. need a network for that. That is the antithesis of the future because you are always going to be working for the man. And this mm -hmm. that's what freedom is. Freedom is I own this. I own my yeah. feed. I own my node, so I can, I own, that's my basic bank, I get my payments, and I'm going to try and make this work. Just like if I'm, if I'm a busker, you know, I'm out there as my content, if people like it, they will give me money, they can determine how much, um, you know, I can make a living off of that. Um, I'll, I, you know, I may have my regulars, there's the guy, that guy from Central, from Central Park. Uh, he's the guitar man, he's been doing it for 25 years. Just, he, sure. does, he does a Broadway show every year uh, from the proceeds, he has enough left over to do a whole show with as many people in the audience as he can get to normally see him in Central Park. So this is just a mindset. It's just a mindset. Yeah. When you're born into thinking you got to work for the man, then this. Now with your with your operation, man, um, I completely believe that your audience will support you. But it's not yeah. an either or thing. You don't have to do one or the other. You can do both. Let the audience sure. help you figure it out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. They're an active participant. That's that's the big thing. They're active participants in this in this game now. Yeah, and you're right. I mean, the the whole creator community has uh, flourished. The cool thing is, is that the nice thing, I guess, is that all these platforms have enabled a ton of creators to kind of get into the space. I mean, when I started in media, it was just print and email, and that was it. And you know, trying to get and talk the man into going into podcasting you know, 15 years ago was like, you know, pulling teeth and trying to pitch them the idea of something we're doing here. That was absolutely, you know, uh, it was foreign to them completely. So yeah, yeah mm -hmm. they, they just didn't move in that capacity. Now I think we're seeing so much more uh, speed in, in terms of transition of media and, and just also just content in general and the creative side of it, of where it's going. We've mm -hmm. seen that here in our own uh, show for sure. Listen, man, Adam Curry, wow, thank you so much for the interview today. Uh, hopefully all of you guys out there listening and watching right now uh, have had a great joy with uh, having Adam on. So thanks again for stopping in. We appreciate it. Paul, well, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, of course, I first got turned on you when, uh, when you had my friend Andrew on. I'm like, oh, okay, so this is something worth watching. Uh, yeah. it's, it's really enjoyable. And I really appreciate you letting me go wild on my rants because I, <laughs> I kind of have a two modes, an on or an off. And hopefully you were able to Not distill it for the audience so that they kind of get what I'm talking about. But um, it's really good to have someone take it seriously from this angle yeah. the way you have. Because um, yeah. I appreciate that. This, it's, it's often glossed over or people yeah. don't want to do the effort to understand what's happening and are scared away by buzzwords and, and FUD that's uh, spinning around. So... It's, oh, yeah, it's really sure. appreciated. And uh, anytime you uh, want to consider value for value, if you need any help setting up, let us know. We'd be happy to, to jump in for you. I will. I'm, I'm going to shoot you an email on that uh, process because I think it's something very interesting for sure. All right. So thanks again, Adam. Um, all of you listening in, of course, over on the podcast, whether you're on iTunes, Spotify, Google, anywhere you get your podcast, make sure you leave us a rating and also give us any comments that you think, hey, let's get someone else on the show that you want to see or hear. Um, for TechPath, we'd love to hear that. If you have an idea for a show, just shoot us an email to producer at reverendnetworks.com. And you can always hit me up on Twitter at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.